आज भारत में इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल का बाजार जितनी तेजी से बड़ा हो रहा है कुछ साल पहले तक उसकी कल्पना भी नहीं होती Ola Electric is all set to file its papers for its initial public offering. India's first EV company to file for an IPO. This journey is not going to be easy. The reason I became an entrepreneur, the reason Ola exists is to truly make an impact and a deep impact on society. Government has permitted to set up EV charging points across 69,000 petrol stations in the country. As per their numbers in the DRHP, they have uh, more than 200,000 bikes which are already on road. Hi everybody Ola Electric is going IPO and this is yet again one of the most awaited IPOs in the Indian stock market in 2024 While on one side one segment of the investors are bullish on electric vehicles because it's the next big revolution in India on the other side not just Ola but even other EV companies are bleeding with thousands of crores in losses Ola Electric itself reported a loss of 784 crores in fiscal year 2022 1472.08 crores in fiscal year 2023 and 267 crores in the 3 months ending in June 2023 respectively the IPO bound company has reported an operating loss of 136 million dollars losses in FY23 amounted to rupees 1472 crore versus rupees 784 crore in FY22 and even with these losses in their financials Ola is still very confident of getting a wonderful IPO response So for this episode we went deep into these 400 pages of DRHP that Ola Electric filed with SEBI so that we can help you understand what does the two wheeler market of electric vehicles in India look like where does Ola Electric stand in the electric race of India as compared to Hero Electric TVS and Astra Energy why are they so confident about their IPO in spite of incurring thousands of crores in losses what are the risks that Ola Electric is facing in the heated market of India and lastly when Ola Electric goes IPO Should you invest in Ola Electric or not? But before we move on, I want to quickly thank One Percent Club for supporting our content. People, the new year is finally here, and as usual, we all plan to go to the gym every year, but we always fail miserably. Now, I can't help you build your physical fitness, but I can help you build your financial fitness. This is where the magic of my dear friend Sharan's One Percent Club comes in, and you might know him as Finance with Sharan. The One Percent Club is India's largest finance community with almost fifty thousand members. So this new year, the one resolution you should definitely have is to take control of your hard earned money and to invest your money wisely this is why sharan is hosting a personal finance masterclass this sunday specially for think school learners this 2 hour masterclass has been attended by more than 2 lakh individuals and has a rating of 4.8 in this masterclass sharan will teach you everything about personal finance starting from insurance to your investments this masterclass will finally help you take control of your financial independence and you know what i have convinced sharan to give all think school learners an exclusive 50% off on his masterclass and this is the first time he is ever giving a discount on his course so go ahead utilize this opportunity sign up for the masterclass and take control of your finance in 2024 and now on with the episode To understand Ola Electric, or for that matter, any electric mobility company, you need to understand the three critical variables of EV business, and these variables are price, margins, and quality. And any company that masters these three variables will go on to win the EV race in India. And if you go deep into these attributes, you will actually see a matrix because price is dependent on three parameters, which are scale of production. common subsidies and vertical integration margin is dependent on four parameters which are scale vertical integration cost of raw materials and research and development and quality is dependent on three parameters which are vertical integration competitive comparison and research and development now i know this matrix looks very very complex but don't worry at all i will break it down in such a way that after the explanation is done Simply by looking at this matrix you can analyze any electric mobility company very very easily so let's get started The most important parameter in this entire matrix is vertical integration 
Now, if you know what is vertical integration and how important it is in the context of electric mobility, please skip to this timestamp. And if you don't, here's a very, very simple explanation of vertical integration and why is it important for Ola Electric. The best analogy to understand vertical integration would be to understand the functioning of a pizza company with and without vertical integration. So let's say Pizzario is a pizza company that works like a traditional pizza company. And here's how they would operate without vertical integration. They will source each of their ingredients from different vendors depending on the price and quality that they offer. So flour will be purchased from three vendors at an average of 20 rupees per kilo for Gujarat, Karnataka and Maharashtra specifically. Now, if you look into the cost of production of flour, these vendors are producing their flour at 15 rupees a kilo and they are selling it to Pizzario at 20 rupees per kilo. So, this price includes a 5 rupees markup which serves as the vendor's profit margin. Similarly, the cheese vendors produce cheese at 150 rupees a kilo and sell it to Pizzario at 200 rupees per kilo. Vegetables are produced by local farmers at 20 rupees a kilo and sold to Pizzario at 30 rupees a kilo. Meat is produced at 200 rupees a kilo and is sold to Pizzario at 250 rupees a kilo. Now keep this in mind and let's move to production. Their rent and utility cost for kitchen is 10,000 rupees per month. So if the kitchen produces 1,000 pizzas per month, the cost boils down to 10 rupees per pizza. Similarly, labor costs 15,000 rupees per month. So the labor cost per pizza turns out to be 15 rupees per pizza if they produce 1,000 pizzas per month. And lastly, Packaging costs 5 rupees per box when bought from a supplier who produces the box at 3 rupees per box. And after this, their in house delivery guy delivers the pizza for 10 rupees per pizza. So, with all these costs, if you look at the total cost per pizza, the average cost for flour, cheese, vegetables, and meat per pizza turns out to be 100 rupees per pizza. Kitchen costs 10 rupees, labor costs 15 rupees. Packaging costs 5 rupees and distribution costs 10 rupees. So the total cost of producing and delivering a pizza is 140 rupees per pizza. This pizza is then sold for 200 rupees per pizza. So the profit margin is 60 rupees per pizza or 30%. Now in this system, if you see, the pizza company is only producing pizza and does not have to deal with the headache of producing the cheese, growing the vegetables, taking care of the animals or grinding the flour. They simply have to procure these materials from the respective vendors for every state, every season. So the capital expenditure of the company is only limited to the pizza production. So this looks pretty clean and simple, right? Well, if you look deeper into the system, this system has three major disadvantages. Firstly, the vendor might deliver products with inconsistent quality. For example, a farmer from Gujarat might use a great quality pesticide spraying technology and he would produce great vegetables. But the Maharashtrian farmer might use a primitive technology which might overspray pesticide and degrade the quality of vegetables. Secondly, the vendor might suddenly increase the price if there is a fluctuation in the market. For example, if the demand for tomatoes goes up in Gujarat and the cost goes up from 20 rupees to 100 rupees a kilo, then the vendor might ask you to pay 100 rupees because he is getting a better price in the market. And this will eventually either reduce your margins or you will have to charge your customers more for the same pizza. And lastly, because the pizza company is paying extra to the vendors, the company's profit margins get affected. So for a non-vertically integrated company, all three parameters, which are quality, price and margins are inconsistent and fluctuating. But at the same time, they do not have the headache of extensive investment into farmers, factories for cheese and processing units. If this is very, very clear to you, let's understand how the same company would operate with vertical integration. In this scenario, the company would extensively invest into dairy farms, vegetable farms, flour processing units and even buy chicken farms. Now this will definitely stretch the capital expenditure of the company by a huge margin. But if you look at the benefits it provides, it becomes very very lucrative. So let's look into how this vertical integration will benefit the company in the long run. This time, since the company produces its own flour, it can produce and procure flour at 15 rupees a kg because this time the vendor belongs to the company itself. Similarly, the cheese is procured from the in-house cheese factory at 150 rupees a kg instead of 200 rupees a kilo. Vegetables grown on company owned farms are procured at 20 rupees a kg instead of 30 rupees a kg. And meat is sourced from company owned chicken farms 
at 200 rupees a kg instead of 250 rupees a kg this is how vertical integration would reduce the cost of raw materials by a large large extent if this is very very clear to you let's move on to production costs here the cost will stay the same at 10 rupees per pizza for rent and utilities and 15 rupees per pizza for labor for packaging again the boxes will be procured from company's own in house pizza box manufacturing facility at 3 rupees per box instead of 5 rupees per box and lastly delivery would cost the same as before at 10 rupees per pizza because even before the delivery was done in house and now for this vertically integrated scenario if you do the cost comparison of producing a pizza you can see the magic of vertical integration this time the cost of base ingredients reduces from an average cost of 100 rupees to 75 rupees per pizza kitchen costs the same 10 rupees per pizza labor costs the same 15 rupees per pizza but packaging cost again drops from 5 rupees per box to 3 rupees per box and distribution cost again stays the same at 10 rupees per delivery So now the total cost of producing and delivering the same pizza is just 113 rupees as compared to 140 rupees in the previous scenario. And now if you sell the same pizza at 200 rupees your profit margins would be 43.5% as compared to 30% in the previous scenario. And you know what even if you reduce the price of pizza to 190 rupees your margins would still remain at 40.5%. So vertical integration brings three major superpowers to the table. Number 1, even if you decrease the cost of your products, your margins still remain higher than your competitor. Number 2, since all vegetables, cheese and meats are being produced in your own farm, you can control the quality and consistency of the products with standard technology. And lastly, if you own the farm, you do not have to worry about price fluctuations because your vendor will sell only to you regardless of the demand in the market. This is how vertical integration gives a company an extraordinary control over price, margins and quality. Now, in case of Ola Electric, if you read their DRHP paper, the term vertical integration is mentioned again and again and again. Why? Because even Ola Electric has a vertically integrated system whereby there are six parts of the electric two-wheeler value chain. These are raw materials, research and development, manufacturing, sales and distribution, charging network and after sales. So a traditional company might just import scooters from China, assemble it in India and sell it in India or sometimes after sales is outsourced to a third party or sometimes even research and development is outsourced and just a white label product is sold in the Indian market. But if you look at Ola Electric, they do their own research and development, designing, manufacturing, sales and even after sales is done using their own teams. So just like the pizza company can control the price, quality and margins of their pizzas without giving away the margins to the vendors, Ola Electric does everything by themselves because of which they can control the quality, price and the margins of their scooters. So if this is very very clear to you, let's look at each of these segments and understand the points of skepticism attached to each segment. The first segment is raw material procurement and this is perhaps the only part of the value chain that Ola does not have in complete control because like we saw in the previous EV case study the electric mobility raw materials like lithium and cobalt are dominated by Chinese but if you look at the rest of the five parts Ola stands at a very strong position because they are all vertically integrated firstly they've invested heavily into R&D of the cell battery pack software electronics motor drive terrain and even manufacturing technology for manufacturing they have a giant plant in tamil nadu which can produce 1 million units per annum they plan to expand this to 2 million per annum by next year and it can further be expanded to 10 million units per annum however if you look at their last year's sales numbers you will see that the company sold only 250000 scooters and according to dave mukherjee who's the managing director of anglian omega group he says that india hardly consumes 6 million scooters in total so even if we assume a 50% conversion to evs the figures claimed by ola electric simply don't add up similarly for battery manufacturing they have the ola giga factory Now if you look at their targets by 2026 they aim to touch 20 gigawatt hour capacity and according to economic times they intend to stretch it to a capacity of 100 gigawatt hour 
Now the catch over here is that if you look at the biggest battery manufacturers in the world, you will see that back in 2018, BYD set up the largest battery manufacturing plant in the world with an installed capacity of 24 gigawatt hour. And this was back then the largest gigafactory in the world. There's a new king in the EV world. And who's the new king? China's BYD. JC Motors, which has exclusive rights to selling BYD cars in Hong Kong, says there's been a growing acceptance for more affordable Chinese EVs like BYD. So BYD is one of the few automakers and of such scale that has a vertically integrated supply chain. So they have, uh, they build their own batteries, they're into a lot of the upstream production in terms of mining. So they, by being directly in the heart of the supply chain, they can control more of their costs. And BYD is not some random player. If you look at this chart, they are the third largest battery manufacturer in the world. So BYD was able to extend its capacity because they have the superpower of sourcing their lithium and cobalt from their own mines in Africa and other countries. But you know what? In spite of that, BYD had been facing a lot of issues in scaling up their manufacturing. In fact, till 2021, BYD just had an installed capacity of 26.4 gigawatt hour, which increased by 167% to 70.4 gigawatt hour by 2022. So the skeptical question over here is that when BYD found it difficult to touch 70 gigawatt hour, how will Ola Electric achieve 25 to 100 gigawatt hour capacity without having direct access to the same raw materials? This is the story of Ola Electric's vertical integration. So to summarize this part, Ola Electric has the capacity to manufacture 1 million units, will extend to 2 million units and can extend to 10 million units, but sold only 252,000 units in 2023. And you know what? The DRHP also says that Ola is required to achieve 1 gigawatt hour capacity in the first year in fiscal 2024, 5 gigawatt hour capacity in the second year, 10 gigawatt hour capacity in the third year, and 20 gigawatt hour capacity by fourth year. And if they fail to achieve the agreed upon capacity each year, the government of India has the right to deduct the subsidy payable to Ola Electric. So this is a very, very important variable. If this is very, very clear to you, let's understand their control over sales and distribution. If you compare Ola's distribution with its competition, this is what it looks like. While Honda has 2,041 dealerships, TVS has 3,836, Hero stands at 887, and Ather stands at 36, whereas Ola has 948 centers. Then we come to charging network, and this is something that will not just benefit Ola Electric, but all EV companies put together. Electric vehicle charging infrastructure The Ministry of Heavy Industries took center stage with visionary initiatives to promote sustainable mobility and bolster the electric vehicle sector. Government has permitted to set up EV charging points across 69,000 petrol stations in the country. So if you look at the state of charging in India, it is improving very, very quickly. If you look at this graph, the number of charging stations has increased from just 6,000 in 2022 to 19,000 in 2023. And by 2027, India is expected to have 1 lakh charging stations. And lastly, we have the after-sales support. And here, it's pretty straightforward. If Ola gives out better after-sales support, it will do well and it will prosper. If it doesn't, then it will fail in the Indian market. Because one of the biggest points of skepticism with Indians is servicing and after-sales support. And this is something that our fathers can confirm very well. And one of the reasons why Honda Activa became so popular in India is because its after-sales service was way better than its competitors. This is how, with vertical integration, Ola is taking a giant step in controlling its quality, price and margins. So if Ola Electric's competitor is not vertically integrated, they might not be as strong as Ola Electric could be with these three parameters. If this is very clear to you, let's come back to our matrix. We understood the strength and weakness of Ola Electric in its vertical integration. And while covering vertical integration, we've also covered the merit behind the scale of production and the raw material procurement weakness. Now let's come to the next important parameter, which is price. Price is dependent on two things apart from vertical integration, which are government subsidy and scale of production. Now, if you look at this infographic in the DRHP, you will see where the sweet spot of EV success lies. This is what the TAM or total addressable market of two-wheeler vehicles in India looks like. There is a total space for 16 to 17 million two-wheelers, out of which the biggest chunk of scooters lies in the sweet spot of less than 1 lakh rupee segment. And the moment you go above 1 lakh rupees, 
the market size reduces by 10 times from 5.3 million units to just 0.45 million units. Similarly, for bikes, the sweet spot lies in less than 2 lakh rupees segment. And the moment you go above 2 lakh rupees, the TAM drops by 50 times to just 0.2 million units. So the sweet spot for scooters is in the less than 1 lakh rupees segment. But if you look at the cost of two-wheeler EVs in India, you will see why it's very difficult to do business. This table shows the cost before and after the fame to subsidy got reduced from June 2023. And here we can see that all two-wheeler EVs cost more than 1 lakh rupees even with subsidy. And now that the subsidy has been reduced, the cost has shot up to a range of 1.3 to 1.4 lakh rupees. Now, with these costs, the companies will have to achieve economies of scale and they will have to bring down their cost range between 90,000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees. Why? Because if you look at the best selling scooters in India, Honda Activa and Jupiter together dominate more than 50% of the market and their cost range is 90,000 rupees to 92,000 rupees. This is the price that Ola, Ather, TVS and Bajaj will have to reach to achieve a hockey stick growth in their sales. So, whichever company gets to this price point first, they will have a huge edge over their competitors. This is the reason why the government subsidy is meant to solve the gold star problem of cost and scale. And if you remember from our previous EV episode, if these subsidies are given, the cost of the vehicles will go down. This will lead to more demand because more people will be able to afford it. This will lead to economies of scale for these companies, which will decrease the cost of production, which will again lead to less cost leading to more demand. And if you read the DRHP paper, Ola Electric is eligible for many subsidies. I'll give you the list in the description so that you can read and understand the opportunities and the risk that these subsidies bring to the table. So FAME is just one of these many many subsidies that was decreased from June 2023. This is the reason why if you look at Ola Electric sales after May, it fell drastically from 28,700 units to just 17,700 units and then in November 2023, it again crossed 28,000 units. So this way, even without subsidy, the company that achieves better economies of scale to price your products at less than 1 lakh rupees will win the game in the EV race of India. Now when and how will this happen? We will have to wait and watch as investors. So if this is very really clear to you, you've understood three more elements in the matrix, which are price, scale and subsidies. And this brings us to the last element in the matrix, which is quality. This is something that only customers and bike reviewers can tell you because this is a very, very subjective parameter. I will leave the most popular review channels that I could find in the description so you can have a look or you can understand the quality difference of these vehicles with your own experience. And this brings us to the final segment of the episode and that are the risks that Ola Electric is facing, which you need to be aware of as investors and students of business. Firstly, we have the risk of raw material access due to Chinese domination. Secondly, there is risk of subsidy cancellation if they do not meet targets. In that case, Ola electric vehicles will become costly and they won't be able to compete in the market as well as they're able to compete right now. Thirdly, there is risk of inflation which might again shoot up the cost of their vehicles. This brings us to the fourth risk which is the risk of not being able to achieve scale. So if Ola Electric does not achieve economies of scale and get to this less than 1 lakh rupee mark, then customer adoption will again slow down. The fifth risk is the risk of inadequate access to public chargers for consumers that could adversely affect the demand for electric vehicles in general. These are the most important risks according to us and there are many more which you can find in the DRHP paper which is attached in the description. If this is very, very clear to you, let's quickly summarize this entire case study in 90 seconds. What did we learn today? We learned that any electric vehicle company's success will be based on three parameters, quality, price and margins. And these parameters are raw material sourcing, vertical integration, R&D, subsidies by the government, who achieves less than 1 lakh rupee price point, scale and quality. Then we learned that Ola Electric does not have strong access to raw materials as compared to BYD. Their vertical integration in R&D are pretty strong. Their subsidy game is strong because they're eligible for many subsidies. But if they fail to meet the targets, these subsidies will go away and they will face a risk. For price, Ola Electric and many of its competitors are struggling to go below the 1 lakh rupee price point. And when it comes to scale, Ola Electric right now is at a very small scale of just 2.5 lakh units. 
and it needs to touch 1 million units in sales if they want to take advantage of their factory's capacity. For distribution, they have a wide scale distribution but not as much as TVS or Honda already have and quality is subjective. Lastly, all the risks are mentioned on the screen and the rest you can find in the study materials. So the ultimate question is, should you invest in Ola Electric or not? Well, I'm not a finance influencer guys and this is not an investment advice case study. So even if I give you investment advice, you should not take it. So follow Rachana Ranade ma'am for investment related content and come here only to learn business. That's all from my side for today. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political content, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.